get a platform team in Netflix and Silicon Valley. And today I'm going to talk about our petabyte scale big data platform that's running 100% on Amazon Web Services Cloud. And so I, I want to start with a quick survey here. So how many of you guys here have any idea about what kind of technology Netflix is working on? You know, all of our tech cloud, our Cox, you know, those kind of stuff. Anyone following your work here? Okay, not bad. So what we are doing is our main business is so we are streaming content over the internet, you know, all these exclusive content that we build on like House of Cards. Orange is the new black, you know, those kind of stuff. And we are, previously we were just mailing DVDs around and then when the internet era, with the internet era, the internet got powerful, the end host got powerful. And then we just started serving the content over the internet. So today I will not go talk about the streaming part of it, but I will mostly speak about the big data platform part, the, the, the data processing part of the platform. And Netflix is a data-driven company. So whatever decision we take, like uh, whether it's a business decision or it's a technical decision, you know, all this stuff, we just run experiments, collect data, and then do statistical analysis on top of it, and then take a, take a good decision. And today, I will just give a few examples of how we use data, the, the use cases that we have. And, hopefully convincing these examples that big data platform that we have built is a, a centerpiece of that decision-making process. So here is one example. So this is the screenshot of a web application called Ignite. So this is an A-B testing tool. So what our engineers do is like, if for example, they want to make a change in the Netflix.com web UI, they just run some A-B tests. So for, for a group, they show the original Netflix web UI. And for another experiment group, they show the web UI with the change. They run experiments, they collect the data, and they check some performance met metrics like uh, streaming hours or retention, and then say like whether the change is good or bad. And this UI just shows the results of the A-B test that our engineers do. And the back end of this web application is powered by our systems. Uh, in particular, it's the, it's the Presto distributed SQL engine that powers the back end. I will talk about Presto shortly today. And here's another example. And this is the Netflix.com web page, the main page when you uh, point your browser at it. And what this shows is like all these nice movies that, that we offer nice content. And the first part where data is used is the recommendation algorithm. So whenever you log in, you get some personalized recommendations. And those recommendation algorithms are just machine learning algorithms. And those algorithms are trained on our infrastructure using Apache Spark or Hive. You know, those kind of distributed compute engines. And that's one part of the story. The other part is the order of these movies within, within a row and across rows is also determined by some ranking algorithm. And that ranking algorithm, part of that ranking pipeline, is also running as an Apache Spark job in our distributed infrastructure in the big data platform. And there are many other examples. These are just some of the interesting user-facing examples. And there are many other parts of the infrastructure that depend on the big data platform services. So our biggest challenge is scale. We have a massively distributed system to serve a lot of subscribers that we have. And in fact, we just went global at the beginning of this year. So we are serving more than 190 countries in the world right now. And we have like more than 80 million subscribers just streaming content like crazy. We have 120 million hours streamed per day. And we are supporting more than 1,000 devices, like mobile devices, tablets, phones game consoles, you know, all the setup boxes. So we have a wide range of devices that we support. And there's this platform part of it of the scale too. Like we, we are pushing to our data pipeline like 100 billion events a day. And then that's eventually demultiplexed, gets written to the 40 petabyte data warehouse that we have, Hive data warehouse, which is stored on Amazon Simple Storage Service, the S3 system. And then daily, we read like three petabytes of data per day, and then we process it with all the tools, all the logic that we want to do, and then we write like 300 terabytes a day back to S3. So these are some of the metrics that show the scale of our infrastructure. So let's get a little bit, a little bit technical, and then I would like to give a glimpse of how, data, how our data pipeline looks like. So this, is, this really shows where the data come from, so we have two data pipelines right now. One is the event data pipeline on the top and the dimension data, the subscriber data pipeline at the bottom. So 
the event data pipeline usually runs under a minute, runs around a minute, and the data is just collected from all the cloud applications that we run on the Amazon Web Services cloud. And these applications may be user-facing or not. They, those may be microservices. We just collect data from the users. Like, for example, if you go to Netflix.com and do a search or stream a, stream a movie, stop it, whatever, all these events are collected from the cloud apps and then pushed through our Kafka clusters and then sent to Ursula, which is an open source system that we build in the big data platform team. And then Ursula just demultiplexes those events and writes them to S3 eventually. And the bottom pipeline is a dimension data pipeline, which runs daily, every 24 hours. What we do is like, we have a MapReduce job that gets the subscriber data from Cassandra database, that, that's, that's our online database facing our, facing our customers. And then the MapReduce job gets the data, processes it into some format, does some conversion, does some analytics on top of it, and dumps it to S3. And after this part, our platform kicks in, really. So because after this point, what happens is our engineers at Netflix can just use the tools that we build, can use the systems that we build to process these data. So as I said, everything is on S3. It's 100% S3. All the data is on S3 in Apache Parquet format. So I will talk about Parquet today. It's a binary columnar format. So on top of that, we have a number of compute engines. All these are distributed compute engines. They're all open source, like Spark, Hive, Presto, which is a SQL engine. Pig is an old, uh, it's, it's an old engine that supports some Pig Latin declarative language and Druid for interactive uh, processing. And on top of that, we build a number of high-level services to, to open up unified, easy-to-use interfaces to our internal users. And Genie is a federated execution service that we built, and I will briefly talk about it today, how it allows us to build, to, to support multiple Spark versions in our infrastructure. And Metacad is a distributed federated metadata service. So every data has some corresponding metadata. Like think about it as a schema of your table. So you need to get this schema from somewhere when you do the processing. So Met Metacad is doing that. It's still, it's not open source, but it will be open source soon. And we have a number of tools built on top for, for ease of access and ease of use of these services like forklift for transport, you know, visualization, quality, or performance visualization, monitoring, all the stuff. We have a number of tools that really gives a lot of visibility and ease of use to all this complex machinery. And on top is a one-stop shop, the big data portal, where you can just open your browser and then go and access any of these engines from a browser. You can just write some SQL. You can just say, like, OK, run this on Spark. Run this on Presto. And then it runs it, gets the data back. You know, it's, it's very easy to use. And the big data portal depends on a Python library, the big data API that we build. Uh, it's just all convenience. You can just import that library in your Python application and access whatever you want in this compute platform, in this whole mess. So let's start to get more technical. Let's dive into some of these tools and technologies. And let's start with the Parquet file format. So Parquet was, it started several years ago as a collaboration between Clouder and Twitter. <clears throat> And then the idea that Parquet implemented was, was not new, actually. It was just proposed by Google in their Dremel paper for assembling records for potentially deeply nested structures. And Parquet just implemented that. And then eventually, it became an Apache top-level project. And then initially, we were using Hadoop sequence format. And then we did some evaluation. And we saw a lot of potential in this format. Like, it brings a lot of performance improvements. So we gradually migrated in 2004 from sequence to parquet file format. So the ideas, like I said, the ideas are not new. It's just the, the implementation is new. So it's a columnar format. The column data is just laid out contiguously. Like the colors here, the blue one is just a layout of a single column. The, the other color, the purple, is layout of another column. It's, not, it's different than traditional row-based layouts of relational database systems. And this layout on physical storage has a number of advantages compared to row layouts. So one thing is it provides efficient projection. So if you want to access a particular column, you just scan, seek to the beginning of that column and do a read of a column chunk. It's pretty fast. And the other benefit is compression. So when you compress columns together, there will be similar values because you're in the same column. Let's say you have a column H. They're all integers. And since it, it has a 
the, the, the values are similar, they are of type int, they tend to compress much better due to the way compression algorithms work. So you get these two nice benefits. And also there's a lot of good community support of Parquet. So all these tools that, that are listed here have great support for Parquet. You can just get it and work with Parquet files out of the box. And if you start zooming into the file, like get a microscope and zoom in, you will see like there are multiple row groups in a Parquet file. A row group is a collection of rows. So all your column data is laid out on disk within row groups. And every column data is in a particular column chunk. So let's say you have three columns. These three column chunks will have the raw data in your file. And then if you zoom in further, you will see like all these columnar data are split up, split up into pages. So pages are the smallest indivisible unit of data that Parquet compress and encode. So this is what you get on disk eventually. And every file has a footer at the bottom. So it contains a lot of metadata like the schema of your of your file, the version information, and also you have some metadata for the row group, like the how many rows I have, you know, what's the size of this data on disk, those kind of metadata. And also you get a number of column metadata, like the encoding used, which encoding I am using in this file, what's the size of this column, what are the min and max in, in, this, in this range of values that I have in this column chunk. So this, this looks like useless data, but this is pretty useful when you start processing this data. For example, Let's take age column again. Say you want to run a SQL query that says, give me all the people with age greater than 30. What an engine can do is look at the mean max values for the age column. So in that particular file, if the maximum age is less than 30, I don't need to read that file. I can just skip forward. So you can do a lot of cool optimizations that just make use of these cool metadata here. Now, let's go a bit higher and take a look at Presto. And Presto is an open source, cool distributed system for running SQL queries in an interactive way. That's the, I think the strongest point here is interactive. That's the strongest keyword here. You can process a lot of data with traditional ANSI SQL in a cluster of machines very fast. That's what Presto does. And we evaluated Presto two years ago against Drill and Spark SQL at that time. And then did a number of benchmarks and evaluation. And we deployed it to production for a number of reasons that we can talk later. But we love it at Netflix because it's Hadoop friendly. If you have a Hadoop deployment in place in your production environment, if you have a higher meta store, you can just throw Presto at your infrastructure and point Presto to your high meta store and then start processing data. It just integrates well with the old Hadoop tools. And it works pretty well on AWS, Amazon Web Services, because it is a very good S3 file system implementation. So you have high meta store, press the points at that, get the metadata, and then you, you can get the data from S3 because it has a nice connector to S3. And it's pre pretty scalable. I mean, it's deployed in Netflix. It's deployed at Facebook where it was built. So Facebook built this system, and Facebook is running a lot of cl uh, clusters of Presto, you know, probably more than a few hundred nodes. We are running it on a lot of, you know, more than 200 nodes right now. It's proven to be scalable at our scale and at, at Facebook scale right now. And it's ANSI SQL. It doesn't you know, require, require you to learn another SQL dialect, like Hive query language or you know, a specific dialect that you need to learn. And it's open source, and it's in, it's in Java. You can just check the code out, you know, make modifications, build it, and deploy your cluster. And, and finally, it's pretty fast. So this is a benchmark that we ran. It's evaluating Presto, I guess, point 125 version, something like that, and high 1.0. And this is showing the query completion type for three different types of queries, where one is a group by query, one is a group by aggregation plus some join, and another one is a needle in a haystack, which is like scan this whole table, but give me a few rows that match this predicate, something like that. So the long story short, what this shows is like, depending on your workload, your query, you can get a speed up of four to five X to several orders of magnitude with Presto compared to Hive. And there are reasons for it, and the number one reason being with Hive, when you're running on MapReduce, every stage that you have in your application just serializes all the data to disk, to HDFS, and the next stage picks it up, and which is pretty slow because when you access HDFS, it's like you do a lot of disk I.O. and network I.O., and Presto gets rid of that because Presto just scans the data from S3, and everything is then in memory and streamed through the network. So it's in-memory stream processing architecture that it has. 
and it has plenty of optimizations in its logical optimizer and it does a lot of bytecode generation. It's pretty optimized piece of machinery compared to Hive. So I mentioned like we are running it on several hundred machines. So we have multiple Presto clusters right now. The ad hoc cluster is what our users are using in production. And there is a dedicated Ignite cluster powering the Ignite application that I showed at the beginning of this talk. So the ad hoc cluster is like there is a single master, single coordinator, and there is 220 machines attached to that coordinator, which are all running on R3 for Excel, EC2 instance type, which is a you know, memory optimized instance. And this cluster, interestingly, supports uh, elasticity. That is, you can just expand the cluster if you have workload to process or shrink it if you don't have anything to do. And similarly, the Ignite cluster is, is a small cluster. It's like 10 machines. It's running on a compute-optimized EC2 instance like C38XL. Again, you can just expand and shrink it based on your workload requirements. So when you want to productionize an open source system, you really need to integrate that with, with your tools. So <clears throat> this is what we do with, the, with, the, with Presto. So with Presto, what we need to do is like, we need to integrate it with our systems at Netflix. So here's the Presto cluster. <coughs> here's the Presto cluster. The yellow one, the, the, the blue one is the sidecar that's running in, in, in addition to the Presto JVM. So the green one is the Presto JVMs itself. So the red one that you see here is the Presto coordinator. The others are the worker machines. So what we did is like, so whenever a query completes, we just publish that event to our data pipeline, to Kafka, and it's written to S3. So why do we do that for integration? And the reason is, when we do this, later on we can say like, okay, this query accesses this table. So this is really for data lineage, where, where, where you want to really keep track of who accesses which table. And other thing that we do to, did to integrate Presto with our production environment is, publish performance metrics to an open source system that we built called Atlas. So whenever you productionize a system, you want to really monitor it and create alerts on you know, uh, problems and everything. For that, you really need to integrate that particular open source software to your monitoring systems. And this is what we did here. And we published a lot of interesting performance metrics through the sidecar JVMs to our Atlas monitoring system. And if a problem happens like, you know, the machine went down or some queries start failing, we just get paged through pager duty and check these metrics on Atlas and then try to understand what was going on at that time in the production environment. And we just don't use these open source tools. We just help Facebook and collaborate with them to build all this cool stuff. And these are some of the contributions that our team made. And number one is related to Amazon file system, the S3 file system implementation in Presto. So we build all these cool features like multiple upload support where we do multi-threaded writes to S3 instead of viewing, doing chunk at a time. So we build support for instance credentials for security. Same for role support, it's a security concept. And also we build a lot of uh, machinery within the file system for better reliability. We also spend a lot of time for complex type support. So the number one goal for complex type support work was bridging the gap between Hive and Presto so that our other, you know, our users who want to you know, make a switch from Hive to Presto they just do it because we built all these nice support to complex types. We added some nice optimization rules to the query opti optimizer that Presto has. So we were rewriting these complex joints and these things into, uh, into forms that are running much faster. Also did a lot of work with the Parquet file format, like bring support for schema evolution where column names change, you know, column types change, those kind of stuff. And also built a cool optimized parquet reader which can you know do the reads in a vectorized fashion. And finally there's a number of other features that we built like graceful worker shutdown, which we use for the shrink mechanism that I mentioned. So we build it so that we can drain the workload on some worker and then gracefully shut it down. And also we have built like a web connector for Tableau, business intelligence tool and other cool features and fixes for the shell, Presto shell. Now this was the Presto part of it, so we use it for interactive SQL processing. Now let's take a look at Spark, which is sort of the, a new system that's out there that Databricks is pushing. And Spark is a distributed, general distributed compute engine. So in addition, I mean, when you look at Spark, comparing it to MapReduce, what we already know, 
it provides additional primitives. So MapReduce just provides a map and reduce functional primitives. But with Spark, you get more than that. MapReduce, and in addition to that, you get a number of other high-level primitives that you can use to construct you know, logical plans or logical data flows. And here you see, at the bottom, three resource managers that Spark supports right now. And one is the standalone resource manager that is coming out of the box with Spark. Other one is Yarn, which is Hadoop Yarn, the uh, yet another resource negotiator, Yarn system that's open source with Hadoop. And the other resource manager is, is Mesos. So Spark can run on any of these resource managers right now, and I will mention that we are running it on Yarn in a minute. And then the core part of Spark, the core module is like there for providing all these system services like scheduling, you know, fault tolerance, you know, all this stuff, or implementing the core resilient distributed data set abstraction in Spark. And on top of Spark Core, people have built all these cool modules like Spark SQL for structured data processing, Spark Streaming for streaming computations, you know, MLlib and GraphX for machine learning and graph algorithms. So this is what Spark offers. And <coughs> we evaluated Spark. So we are currently running mostly pig and high for MapReduce stuff for batch analytics. And we do, we do a lot of ETL pipelines on pig and hive and doing a lot of reporting and analysis on hive, hive engine. And we are doing right now interactive stuff with Presto, but there are two, two additional use cases which doesn't really fit well to Presto or Hive. And these are like one is the iterative machine learning algorithm. So MapReduce is not designed for iterative stuff. So if you start doing iterations on MapReduce, as I mentioned previously, the, the next stage will, the, the, the stage will write the data to HDFS. The next stage, in the next iteration, you will need to pick that, that data up from HDFS and you do this a hundred times, you are hitting HDFS a hundred times, and it kills your performance. But with Spark, you can cache the data in clusters memory, and you can just iterate on that data. And that's pretty fast compared to MapReduce. And another use case is like, we need good, flexible APIs for some custom programmatic use cases that we have. Like with Hive or Pig, you are limited to the language that they provide. Like, you are limited to the Pig Latin language or Hive query language. But with Spark, it gives you a cool Scala API that you can construct very complex data flows easily. So there are currently two Spark deployments at Netflix. One is Spark on Mesos that some other team is managing and doing some stream analytics on top of it. But what we do in the big data platform is we are running Spark on Yarn because we already have a Yarn cluster of you know, several thousand nodes. We just want to use the same cluster, same piece of hardware to run our Spark jobs too. So we are running Yarn on Amazon's Elastic MapReduce service. And currently, we just started doing some batch analytics and doing some ETL stuff. And an interesting uh, thing that we do in our Spark deployment is like we provide support for multiple versions. <clears throat> so what this means is like a user can, you know, from a, from a bash CLI, can just say like, OK, give me a Spark shell with version 1.5. So you can think like multi-version support can be useful you know, in a number of ways. Like, for example, if you have three deployments, three versions, like 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 that you can support, if you hit a bug in 1.4, it may be fixed in 1.5. So you can just point to that new version and get the fix. Or if, you, if there's a new feature in, is available in 1.6, you can just point to that and experiment with that feature. So the, the core system that provides multi-version support is this tool that I mentioned, like Genie, which is a federated execution service. And what it provides in this whole thing, multi-version support thing, is you can configure Genie to have multiple applications, like multiple Spark binaries, and then point those binaries to multiple configuration files. Like, OK, for Spark 1.6, use this set of configuration files. Spark 1.5, use this set of configuration files. And whenever the user asks for, you know, give me Spark 1.5, it downloads the related binaries, related configs, creates a nice sandbox for your job, and kicks it off to the Yarn cluster. <clears throat> and in addition to the multi-version support, there's a very important concept that we deeply care about, which is multi-tenancy. So this is a graph from one of our monitoring tools. And what this shows is like, <clears throat> We are running, the, the blue ones are like the MapReduce containers that are running in our infrastructure in, the, in this Hadoop cluster. And the yellow containers are the Spark tasks that are running in this infrastructure. So we are 
trying to run multiple workloads on the same hardware, and this is called multi-tenancy. And what this brings you is cost and resource efficiency. You have these machines there sitting idle. Instead of you know, letting them sit idle, you just pack the workloads you have, and they are at the same time, when you look at the machine in our cluster, you will see like they are running both map and reduce tasks and spark containers at the same time in the same box. And to provide multi-tenancy, Spark has a very interesting feature called dynamic allocation. And before talking about dynamic allocation and our experience with dynamic allocation, I will just recap the task execution model a bit here. So with Spark, so you have this, all these tasks from your application. What Spark does during runtime is grab some containers from the, from the YARN cluster, the resource manager, and then start submitting those tasks to those containers. And these JVMs, the executors are separate Java processes, JVMs. And then these tasks are dispatched to these JVMs, and the JVMs processes these tasks in separate threads. So the, the, the main thing is like the executors are persistent during the runtime. But with MapReduce, what was happening is you have this task again, the map and reduce tasks. And for each task in your application, MapReduce was just grabbing another JVM. So for every task, you have another JVM that's running that task. So the model is different a bit. So the JVMs are temporary. They are just recycled when the task is finished. But with Spark, the JVMs are staying there when the task is finished. So what dynamic allocation does is, whenever there are pending tasks in your queue while you are running your application, Spark looks at this pending task queue and then if there are, there are uh, workloads, there are tasks to process, it just asks the Yarn resource manager to grab more containers during runtime. And then so it, it is really you know, expanding your cluster, your resources during runtime if you have workload to process. And when your tasks start finishing, it just shrinks the cluster back. So this is what dynamic allocation does. And you know, it just starts slowly when your application starts and then gradually expands the number of containers that you get, number of JVMs that you get. And then when they start staying idle for some time, it just starts re releasing them so that other people can use. And like I said, this is good for multi-tenancy because whenever you need, you acquire all these resources. Whenever you don't need them, you release them so that other people, like other MapReduce applications, can use those resources. And it helps you utilize this you know, cluster resources better because whenever there are idle resources sitting around, you just grab them and then you know, send some Spark tasks on them. And similarly, it's really good for interactive applications. Right? In, if you have a Spark shell open, you know, interacting with the cluster right in, right in, right in, right in front of your monitor. So what happens is like, if you submit a job, it starts expanding so that you can start grabbing the resources so you get this interactivity immediately when you start processing your job. Now I will start talking about our dynamic allocation experience. You know, we deployed this dynamic allocation logic in our YARN cluster. And we started running it on several hundred containers at the same time. So we have this huge cluster of you know, a few thousand machines. And every user can allocate up to 500 containers max. So we deployed this to production. And we started having problems immediately. So I'll just recap some of the problems that we hit and solve. So that if you hit them, you know, these look familiar to you. So the, the first problem that we hit with dynamic allocation on YARN is the, the performance, the poor performance of broadcast variables. So what a broadcast variable means is if you do a broadcast join or if you create a broadcast variable, what it does is it creates a copy of this data and then it sends that copy over the executors, over the workers. So this read-only copy is distributed in a, in a torrent-like protocol. So you have this data is chunked up, distributed, so all the executors replicate this. So during runtime, if an executor requires that data, it just fetches those blocks from a remote executor and then just does its processing. And the problem is, when you use dynamic allocation, the replicas may be removed. Because if the replica, if an executor stays idle, it will be removed. And this causes some problems. Here you see some logs here at the bottom. And you see like a worker has done 70 failed attempts in more than 17 minutes, one seven minutes, you know, 17 minutes to just grab a small block of data. And then we solved this and, you know, what the hell is going on here, you know, 17 minutes to fetch a few kilobytes of data. So we started digging in to try to understand what's going on here. And then what we found is, so this particular executor, so the executor gets a list of locations from the driver 
so that it will just go and you know, fetch these uh, replicas. And then due to dynamic allocation, many of the executors in this location list, the, the replica list, may be stale. Because if you do a lot of, rep a lot of you know, big dynamic allocation and release, this location list can have a lot of stale entries. So this executor get like more than 70 stale entries and started pinging them one by one. And every failure, because that executor removed, caused the retries to kick in. And we have like three retries with five second gaps. So this means a single attempt is like 15 seconds. And you do this 70 times. If you do the math, you will get 17 minutes. So it's just executors are removed. The, exec the, the, the executors are removed. And the receiving side just sees that they, those are live because of the staleness. And the, the fix was pretty easy, actually. What we did is like, if an executor hits multiple failures, it just refreshes the locations from the driver. So the, the time to convergence, time to fetch a, fetch a broadcast variable just falls from 17 minutes to a few minutes at most. So another problem that we have with dynamic allocation is a broken locality optimization. And what was happening is like, so there was this optimization built into the dynamic allocation module. And the optimization is to optimize locality. So if you want to send a task to some machine, so if the data is on that machine, you can just do a, rem do, do a local read instead of reading it remotely. So this is called locality. And to optimize locality, so what we, to optimize locality, <clears throat> what dynamic allocation module did was, if there is a number of pending container requests, so the, the dynamic allocation module was just <clears throat> was just canceling many of these requests so that if it cancels and resubmits those, in the meantime, hopefully some of the machines free up that you need so that you can lend some of the tasks to, 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 to the, these machines and then hopefully get data, data local execution. <clears throat> and what we figure out is like, this didn't play well with S3 because with S3 we didn't have any locality at all. Like all the data is removed on S3. So whether you try to optimize locality or not, you get no locality at all. It's just remote trees all over the place. So what we did was simply for S3 requests, just don't cancel and try to do this optimization. And another thing that we hit, another problem that we hit was <clears throat> with cache data sets. And then the problem is, so like I said, with Spark you can cache data set, you can iterate on them, you know, you can do all kind of cool stuff. And then what we noticed is like, if you cache the data with this code snippet here, when you call persist and count, you will see like the data is brought into cluster memory. We saw like when an executor is remote that contains cache data, so your job will fail. Because the cache data is gone and when you try to access it, you, you won't be able to find it and then the application will just fail. So the solution was out there and simple. So with the default uh, dynamic allocation mechanism, if an executor is staying idle for some time, you just remove it. But with cached executors, with cached data, you just define a new timeout. And then with that timeout is typically set to a longer value. Like in production, we set the default value to one minute. But for cached data, we set it to 15 minutes. So hopefully, you reduce the likelihood of you know, failures due to cached data. So we have made a number of other contributions, you know, all this stuff. I, I won't go into details, but we have fixed a lot of problems with Spark to productionize, and we will talk about it later in our other conferences. So if you're interested in this stuff, just come talk to me after the talk. We can chat. So what's next for us? You know, all this cool stuff that we thought, like Presto, Spark, you know, Hadoop, Pipe. So what's next for our infrastructure is, so we want to get, of course, better performance. There's always room for performance optimizations in Parquet and Presto, you know, all this stuff. Like, for example, you can, using the metadata again in Parquet, you can, like, do check the dictionary if you are using dictionary encoding. Using that dictionary, you can just skip, again, a number of, you know, columns and skip a lot of I.O. So that's one thing that we will plan to look at in the near future. And another thing that we want in our platform is better visibility. So we want to really understand what's going on so that if something breaks, we can just dive in. So currently, we have some visibility with Presto, like with Atlas metrics. But with Spark, we are still you know, integrating it with our production environment. So we want to get more metrics to our Spark infrastructure. And finally, we would like to explore new use cases. Like we, so far, we looked at with uh, Presto, we looked at interactive stuff. With Spark, we looked at ETL. 
know, some interactive, but going forward, we would like to interest other stuff like reporting, data validations, or ETL on Spark a little bit more. So we want to explore these new use cases and try to identify where these different engines can help us in all these different use cases. So I guess the key takeaways that I want you guys to take home is like, first of all, there is a reason why we use all these tools in our production. So we don't just stick to one tool. We just deploy many tools, and we don't do it for fun. We do it for a reason, because you need to really use the right tool for the right job. You cannot really do interactive processing on pig or hive, or you cannot do you know, the flexible custom data flows on pig. You need to use Spark for that. So there is a reason we, we, we deploy all these interesting systems here. So use the right tool for the right job. And the second thing is, we, we are a company that really cares about open source. We, we, we just don't use the systems that are open source. We, we use them, we fix them, you know, we contribute new features, you know, we let, let, the, you know, let the tools scale up, scale out our, you know, distributed infrastructure so that other people can benefit. So what this ends up in like, you can just go, you know, check out these systems and deploy whatever we have in production to your own infrastructure. So whatever we build is just out there. You can just build it for yourself too. And finally, Netflix is one of the, I guess, biggest or if not the, you know, the biggest one using the Amazon Web Services infrastructure. So everything we have is on cloud. So we are 100% cloud right now. And there are a number of advantages there, right? You, know, you don't need to really you know, build this machinery to deploy your software. You don't need to build all these cool services that Amazon provides. You just pay for what you use, and you just, you know, uh, you just need to use them to build your distributed infrastructure. So everything is there. You know, just, just use it. You don't need to spend time thinking about all this infrastructure stuff. Amazon has done you know, much of this stuff for you already. So we have been through all this stuff like Presto, Spark, Parquet, you know, all these cool technologies that we are using in production. And I mentioned some of the details and the, some of the use cases that we use those for. And if you want to learn more about this stuff, so I think the first thing you should do is like go to our engineering tech blog. So we have a number of blog posts there that mention a lot more details than this talk. And also, we will be giving a lot of talks around this summer. Like if you're interested about Spark stuff, where most people are interested in. So we'll be giving some talks in Hadoop Summit and Spark Summit this year. So we will talk about how we productionize Spark for ETL, how we do it, how, what kind of problems we hit. And in addition to these, some of these problems that we hit there, we'll mention a lot of experience that we get on the road. And also, so I would like to, again, thank you all for attending this. You know, hopefully you get a glimpse of what we are running in production and some of our experiences we had with these tools. And you know, I'd like to thank you all again for coming, and I'll be happy to take any questions you guys may have. Thanks, guys. Questions? Any question about anything? Uh, can you give some detailed information about your Kafka cluster? How many nodes do you have? So the Kafka cluster is maintained by a data pipeline. A separate team is a data pipeline team. So what I know is like they are running multiple clusters of potentially up to several hundred nodes. So it's a very big multi-cluster deployment that's processing, like I said, 600 billion events a day. It's a pretty big deployment. In total, yes. In total, there, is, there are several hundred nodes in total this Kafka is running on, yeah. Yes. Uh, can we use uh, another, uh, for example, Presto for, uh, as a SQL context in Spark? Not that I am aware of. There is no system out there that integrates the two. But what I know is like Spark provides an ANSI SQL context too. There is, there is some support for ANSI SQL, but it's very limited. It's almost useless. So if you, if you want to do some serious SQL stuff, either you will use Hive on Spark, but then if you want to the ANSI circle, I guess you don't have much choice. You, you need to go to Presto or some other tool. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good and a tough question. So the, the question is, how do you decide what tool is the right for you? So, 
So to decide that, first of all, you need to understand your use case, and you need to get some requirements. You need to gather some requirements. So like, for example, for Presto, let me give you an example about how we chose Presto. So we wanted to have an interactive execution engine, because these, we have these interactive use cases where analysts just want to get some results in seconds. And we had a number of candidates, like we have Drill uh, from Mapar, Spark SQL from Databricks. We looked at Impala from Clouder, and we have Presto from Facebook. So we collected the requirements. It's like good performance, and then you know, good integration with Amazon, because we are running on Amazon. We don't want to build the whole machinery to integrate it. We want a quick solution. So good integration with Amazon, good stability. Because whatever we are running on, we will run it on several hundred machines. It won't be a toy deployment. So whenever you deploy any of these production systems to 100 machines, they just break. So we want some good stability. So we did, we did some evaluation across all these tools. And then we started crossing them. For example, with Drill, we had some stability problems on several hundred machines. We just crossed it off the list. With Impala, it didn't have any S3 support. So we just crossed it off the list. And it was written in C++. So we didn't want to spend another year to write a C++, C3 file, S3 file system for you know, Drill in C++. So we just crossed it off the list. So we looked at Spark SQL. And then we hit some performance problems. So it wasn't as interactive as advertised. So the performance that we get was very poor. It was like smaller queries was taking several tens of seconds to minutes. But when we evaluated with Presto, what we saw like it was pretty reliable at scale. So we have this S3 file system out of the box. And then the performance was like most of the queries was taking a few seconds compared to all these other engines. So it was just a no-brainer to, to, to take the decision. So you should really understand your use cases. You should benchmark it yourself with your data on your hardware, you know, your performance metrics, and then you, you need to do this across a number of tools and take a decision. Transaction management. So currently, we do not do any transactions. So you mean like a distributed transactions, how, may we, how we manage those, like the consistency and performance, those kind of stuff. So we don't run distributed transactions at all. So these are all NoSQL stuff. You know, these are just independent. These frameworks are like processing independent tasks. So there's, there are no locking, no consistency issues. They are just embarrassing the parallel computations. So we don't do any transactions at all at this part of the infrastructure. So the next step, I mean, like I said, so to scaling, scale it up. So when we, first of all, we need to understand whether we should scale it up or out. So to, to understand that, we usually monitor our workloads and the latencies and everything. If we think like the infrastructure is not capable of handling all these workloads, so we scale it out. So the, the, that's how we scale it out. But <clears throat> so the next step is usually like we look at the you know new use cases. If there is a new use case that really requires us to scale the infrastructure out to provide better performance, to provide lower latency. For example, recently, we have been seeing like our ETL workload is pegging one of our Hadoop clusters. So we think like, okay, the, 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 the right thing to do is probably either optimize these jobs, we do some optimizations to use less resources, or if we cannot do anything else, we just deploy, you know, rent more resources from Amazon EC2, and then, you know, enlarge the cluster. Or use dynamic allocation or you know, auto-expand and shrink to gather more resources when there is more workload to process. So these are usually the things that we do to you know, scale out our systems. Because, uh, why, why I ask this question? Because uh, I know that generally it is uh, built at Phoenix environment and they are going to make some big data problems they are going to solve them. So do you have any chance to look at that kind of solutions? Or? So can you repeat the first part? What kind of solutions are you talking about? Phoenix environment. No. no okay. uh, is it open source? No, it's a general ethics uh, platform. They are also look, looking for that kind of problems. No, no, I'm not aware of that. No, we are not looking at it right now. Any other? How do you make the decision that at the end of the evolution on Spark or on any, any platform, that that's the right uh, end for the solution? So you, you, you collect data. I mean, you have these requirements, like, like I mentioned, Presto versus Spark. So you get your data. And our metric was, like I said, reliability and performance. I look at those metrics. I mean, if one performs obviously better than the other, you know, you go for it. If, if you see, like, 
you don't get much difference between the metrics, you know, the systems seem like on par for your use cases, then I would probably go for the developer community, how active it is, how well the code is written, you know, how the open source project is maintained, is it open or is it a closed, you know, closed community of people, you know, managing the project. There are other software development aspects to it, but for the most part, you just collect the data and, you know, try to, try to understand how it will behave for your use cases. How you are ending with the right solution at the end? How, how you are deciding it? Deciding what? After analyzing some data, mm -hmm. you give a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, how you are sure that that's the right one? So it's, it's, it's statistics then. I mean, the analysts, like for example, for those A-B testing stuff, so they want to take a decision, right? They run experiments, and those experiments, in the end, they, they, when they analyze the results, they create some statistical metrics. There is a lot of statistical theory there that gives you some confidence for the results. So if you make a change and you get a good confidence as a result of your statistical analysis, you can say that, okay, with 90% probability, 90% confidence, my solution is correct. So you cannot get 100% confidence. You just see like, this is probably on average, you know, most of the time this is correct, so you go that way. I mean, if you make a mistake, you can always revert it. So it's not like the end of the world. But statistical tools help you take a good decision most of the time. Druid. So there are some teams using Druid. So what I know about Druid is I'm not that familiar. Drill. Drill. Okay. So you want okay drill. So the last time that we checked drill, it, it has a lot of problems in terms of stability issues. But recently they have just released 1.0 and they, they they are making it more stable. The Mapper is spending a lot of time on that. So after the 1.0 release, we didn't do any evaluation, but I guess it's getting much better. And I'm seeing like some benchmarks around that showing it has good performance. So you can just do a benchmark and see how it behaves for your case. Because it is a schemaless design, I think. Mm -hmm. Schemaless, yeah. Uh, why is uh, why is required schemaless definition? Uh, yeah, the, the drill is discovering the schema itself under the hood. With Hivea, yeah, you need to define the schema of your tables. And the tools just discover that schema and do, do, do the schema evaluation on read and do the processing. I mean, both ways have its you know, advantages and disadvantages. You know, with schemaless, you just point to the data and it discovers it and you do the processing. But with the schema support, it's also more verbose and explicit. So it gives you a lot of info and the engines can use those schema to make better optimizations. So both parts of the world have advantages and disadvantages. Any other? Yeah. Spark streaming, yeah. We do not have a Spark streaming deployment in our platform, but there are some teams using it. And there is a blog post on Netflix engineering tech blog. If you search for that, they mention a lot of details there that, that, that I'm not familiar with because it's some other team that, that's doing that. Any other comments, questions? I guess that's it. So if you have any other questions, I'll be around for the next you know, hour or so. Just catch me. Thank you, guys.